What is zeal of God? This is what we're going to look at today. Hey, I'm glad you're here. This is a video to support my Bible reading challenge. And in today's reading from Romans chapter 9 through 14, I discovered this phrase. It's in um, Romans 10 verse 2, but we're going to look at verse 1 first. So let's look at what Paul says about zeal in Romans chapter 10. Won't take too long. Romans 10, 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Well, you know what? I think that for all of us, certainly for the people that we have influence over or that we care about or that kind of thing, we should be praying that people get saved. That's, you know, I know I talk about Paul a lot and I talk about doctrine a lot and I talk about, you know, things. But look, at the end of the day, my primary audience is Christians. Okay, this this. This quick Bible study is is not, you know, the primary effort is not to um, reach the lost, okay? And I know some of you are going, no, I can't believe he said that. Hey, look, I'm always, I am always looking for people that don't know the Lord and talking to them, okay? So don't, don't take this the wrong way. But quick Bible study, the effort is to help Christians mature in their faith and their walk with the Lord, okay? So don't, don't take me the wrong way. I'm all about people getting saved because without that, well, what's the point of anything? Okay. But once you're saved, well, then what? Do you just hug on to the cross for the whole, rest of your whole life and go, Jesus saved me. And that's it. Right. What is that about? There's a reason why grab my Bible. There's a reason why God wrote this whole huge book, 1100 pages in your typical Bible. So friends, seriously, you got to be honest with yourself. What is this all about if it's just about talking about Jesus and the cross? And a lot of people like to say, oh, every page here is pointing towards Jesus. Okay. You can say that if you want. I, I think this whole thing is about the Godhead. And it's about how God deals with mankind. But there's a lot more here than just Jesus Christ. And again, I know a lot of you are going to run away. Oh, this he's taken away from I'm not. It's all about Jesus Christ. But you know who mostly says things like that? People that haven't read this. They haven't read the whole thing. You know why they don't read it? Because this book will read you. It'll cut your heart coming and going. It'll kick your religion in the teeth. And people don't like it. Oh, and they get into the genealogies and they're like, oh, it's so boring. I don't understand it. Well, get over yourself and grow up in the Lord. It's a big book. It's going to require effort. It's going to be a lot of things you don't understand at first. Did you, did you ever decide you wanted to get in shape and then you went and worked out once and you're like, oh, I don't know why I'm not getting in shape. That's ridiculous, right? And I guarantee you the first time you read this entire book from front to back, you're going to be like, Phew, I don't know what I did. Okay, but then if you do it again, and then you do it again, and you do it again, just like if you were going to exercise, you'd have to do it over. You have to put in the reps. Put in the reps. If you want to get in shape, you got to put in the reps. If you want to understand this book, you got to put in the reps. And you can't just listen to other people talk about it. You can't read other books that are written about it. You got to read the book yourself. Okay. All right. Total rabbit trail. It's not in my bullet points, but there you go, okay? I get accused a lot of, oh, you don't talk about Jesus enough. Hey, the whole thing's about Jesus Christ. But quick Bible study, this specific effort is to help Christians mature in the Lord and quit being little baby Christians holding on to the cross and just talking about Jesus. Because there's a whole lot more that Jesus wants us to know. Do you know that he let, he let a man named Saul that he converted into Paul and gave him all the mysteries and made him a minister of the dispensation of the grace of God and gave him, he was the only apostle to the Gentiles. And he allowed Paul to tell us to follow Paul. Why would Jesus Christ do that? If we were only to follow Jesus Christ and wear our little, what would Jesus do bracelets? Why did Jesus Christ allow Paul multiple times to say, follow me or follow us okay he's talking about barnabas and silas and 
and some of those men that were real close to Paul, he would often say, follow us. So he was meeting himself and these, these select group of men that knew the right doctrine. Paul was all about doctrine. If you've never read the book of Romans, it is a doctrinal thesis. And it makes most Christians' brains melt because they're still hugging onto the cross. Look, the cross was a thing of shame. Get saved, but get away. Okay, these Catholics that wear this thing with Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, shame on them. Shame on them. Jesus is off the cross. Okay, I'm getting fired up. Stupid Catholics, get saved. Jesus Christ is off the cross. All right. Let's get back to zeal of God. So Paul's, his heart's desire and his prayer is that Israel be saved. And, and Paul, you know, first expresses his concern for, and that he's praying for Israel's salvation. So in Romans 10, verse 2, he says, for I bear them record. In other words, he's saying, I testify, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Again, I oftentimes get accused, oh, you have too much knowledge. You're too focused on knowledge. You know, you just need to get in your feelings. Well, bullcrap. The Apostle Paul was all about knowledge. And you know, the Bible, Psalms, Proverbs, it's all about wisdom, right? It's saying, get wisdom. Like, whatever you do, get wisdom. And when you get it, hang on to it. Well, guess what wisdom is? It's a two-part thing. Wisdom is experience plus knowledge. That's what gives you wisdom. So they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Well, in my mind and in my experience, that is the bulk of Christianity today. They have a zeal of God, but if you ask them something simple, like, what does it mean to be a Christian? They go, um, uh, um, well, um, you ask Jesus into your heart. Oh, okay. Well, where's that in the Bible? Um, well, I don't know. John 3, 16. I'm not making this up. These are conversations I've had. Christians don't even know the basics, much less the deeper, you know, this, this, what I refer to as the book of Romans as, as being a doctrinal thesis. Christians read Romans. Well, first of all, they don't read it for the most part. They'll, they'll pick and choose, you know, Romans road stuff. That's cute. It's, it's, you know, it's effective for getting, you know, this basic message of salvation. That's great. But Romans is a doctrinal thesis. And if you're going to understand even part of it, it's going to require you applying your life to it. I oftentimes say, you know, you could spend your whole life reading this thing and never understand all of it. I, I'm going to go so far as to say you could spend your entire life reading the book of Romans and not understand it all. Romans just happens to be my favorite book in the Bible. In fact, I've often asked Christians, hey, if you could only have one book in the Bible, one book out of the 66 books in the, that make up the Bible, which one would you want? For me, there's no question it's the book of Romans. It tells us how to live. It tells us, it tells us what this Christian life is and what it means to be a Christian and how, how we got saved and all of the, it. You know, yeah, I don't want to give up any of the Bible. I'm all about the whole thing. But if I had to choose one, <laughs> it'd be the book of Romans. Okay. So Paul has to acknowledge that while they have a zeal of God, it's not according to knowledge. Okay, so get that. So what does that mean? How does that play out in the lives of the Israelites? They have zeal, but no knowledge. So we don't have to guess. The next verse explains it. Romans 10, verse 3. For they, meaning the Jews, being ignorant of God's righteousness. Well, that doesn't sound like a good thing, does it? Being ignorant of God's righteousness. And going about to establish their own righteousness. Well, that doesn't sound good either. have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So Paul tells us that being ignorant of God's righteousness leads people to attempt to establish their own righteousness. 
And if that's not maybe the penultimate definition of religion, I don't know what is. But the bottom line is it's not possible to establish your own righteousness, at least not in the eyes of God. God doesn't care about your good works. He actually compares them to filthy rags. Okay, Jesus Christ paid it all or he paid nothing. And you get to choose for your life. You're going to either accept the fact that Jesus paid it all, or you're going to try to say, well, Jesus paid some of it, but I have to go to church every time the doors are open, or I have to not sin. Otherwise, I'll lose my salvation. And then I got to get saved again, again. And Paul says something critically important to the Jew, and indeed anyone alive right now. Let's read it. Romans 10, 4. For Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone that believeth. Well, what does that verse mean? What is the law of righteousness that Paul talks about? So, the law of righteousness that Paul speaks of is literally the law of Moses. It's the 613 laws Israel has been under until, until what? <laughs> until Christ put an end to it. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, one of the things he said is, it is finished. Okay, so let's not oversimplify Christ's words. That meant a lot of things. But one of the things it meant was he fulfilled the law. The law of righteousness was over with. He was part of the Melchizedek priesthood. And he was the final sacrifice for sins. So this one verse, Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end. And it's one of the most succinct expressions of the transition between the dispensation of law, meaning the law of Moses, to the dispensation of the grace of God, for which the Apostle Paul was the minister of. So in other words, there, there was once the law of Moses, and the Israel, Israelites were required to follow it, but Christ is the end of the law. <sighs> Have you seen my Bible study called, They Zealously Affect You? If not, I would encourage you to reach out to me. I'll send that to you. You can go find it on my website, quickbiblestudy.com. Just give me your first name and email address, and, and you'll have access to that. So here's the thing. The Apostle Paul was adamant that we be not ignorant. And I'm going to say that zealousness plus ignorance equals religion. Let me say that again. Zealousness plus ignorance equals religion. This equation, zealousness plus ignorance equals religion, is exactly what happened when the Jewish religious leadership confused and stirred up the multitudes. And what did the multitudes say when Jesus was being held captive? Crucify him! Crucify him! That's what religion does to you. Religion will kill Jesus Christ. It'll kill Jesus Christ in your life. And you'll have religion, you'll have ritual, but you won't have relationship. Romans 1.3. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Paul talks a lot about not being ignorant. Did you know that? And it doesn't get any more relevant than this with what's going on with Israel in modern times. Okay. I've often said, if you've seen any of my content, you know, I take a very controversial stand on Israel. I think that this current state of Israel is a counterfeit. It's not God's doing. If you read the, if you read, you know, really the, the major prophets, the Old Testament, and the Bible that talk about the characteristics of what Israel is going to be like when God brings them back, it, it ain't what we're looking at right now. Okay. And one of the proofs that I often bring up is the fact that there's a uh, uh, an Islamic shrine and mosque all set up in the in the center of Jerusalem. 
You think God would allow that? Come on. I don't know who you think you are. Romans 11.25 also says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That sounds like religion. That blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until... Until what? Do you know? Blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until what? Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. In other words... As long as there are Gentiles trusting in Jesus Christ and getting saved, the blindness is going to be on Israel. Israel is in blindness right now because there's still Gentiles getting saved. I don't know who the last Gentile is going to be to get saved, but as soon as that happens, then, then things are going to get real, real crazy in the world. They're crazy enough now, but once that last Gentile gets saved, things are going to get wild very quickly. So that's what I got for today. I hope that I have provoked you to thought. If I've made you angry, let's talk about that. If you've gotten a blessing out of this, let's talk about that. If you think this might help somebody that you care about, share the video. All right. Thanks for being here. And I hope that you have a great Bible read.